So it is my great pleasure to uh, welcome uh, a wonderful guest for a talk with us this evening. Before we get to that, though, just a couple of announcements on behalf of Tacoma Historical Society. Uh, we have uh, new exhibits opening this coming Wednesday. Uh, we have an exhibit about Tacoma's timber history. Uh, and we also have an exhibit that we are hosting that's been put together by the Tacoma Sister Cities, uh, which will have some wonderful artifacts from the history of uh, our various sister city uh, agreements. So artifacts from all over the world, literally, uh, joining us in our museum. So I hope you can come by and see those exhibits. We are at 406 Tacoma Avenue South and open Wednesday through Saturday, 11 a.m. to 3 p.m., starting this Wednesday with those new exhibits. Uh, the other news I wanna share before we turn over to our guest speaker, if you haven't seen the news already, we've been waiting for a long time for this one. The silent film Eyes of the Totem that was filmed right here in Tacoma in 1927 is now available for streaming. Uh, so you can go to our website and find details about how to either rent or purchase uh, your copy of Eyes of the Totem. So we're very happy to share that news after many years of working towards it. Um, and I believe that brings me to the end of my announcements. Uh, so without further ado, let me introduce Claire Keller Schultz, who is representing Metro Parks Tacoma tonight to talk to us about the Dickman Mill Park project. So Claire, I will let you uh, share your screen and take it away. Um, sure. as getting, yeah, and as you're getting set up, I will just ask folks if you have any questions uh, while Claire is presenting, uh, please feel free to put those into the chat. I think what we'll do tonight, just so that you don't have to mute and unmute and all of that is put your questions in the chat and then I will pose them to Claire when we get to the end of the presentation. So uh, take it away, Claire. Thank you, Kim. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Claire keller Scholes, and I'm with the planning department with Metro Parks Tacoma. My current title is um, assets and sorry, I just got a new title, so I'm still memorizing it, but I'm the planning and asset management administrator. So I get to do history of the parks, manage our public art collection, and then also support the various planning efforts that are going on throughout the district. So tonight I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we did with Bickman Mill. So let's go ahead and get into the presentation. Okay, Kim, is that looking like a slideshow? That is, um, I think it's just re-centering itself at the moment. All right, so slideshow, here we go, from the beginning. All right, uh, so as I mentioned, Dickman Mill is one of our sites in the Park District's inventory. Ruston Way is an interesting uh, space for us. This is kind of a hodgepodge of different ownership and management parcels. Metro Parks owns a lot of the green space there, as does the city of Tacoma. So Metro Parks manages it, some of it is city owned, and then of course you have the private operations with restaurants and such. And before I get into the meat of the presentation, I want to take a minute to recognize that we're talking about Ruston Way, which is along the water, which is particularly significant for the Puyallup people. And I want to recognize that we are on indigenous land. Those of us in Pierce County are on the traditional homelands and the Puyallup people. So as we all know, or many of us know, Rustin Way began as an industrial hub, um, as we know it, I should say. And this is a couple of pictures just showing that the hustle and bustle of the heyday when there were mills lining the waterfront. This really began with the arrival of the railroad in 1873. Um, not because there wasn't sawmills before that, but that really allowed the markets to connect with the timberlands and to connect to the harbor, right? So you could bring the logs in from the, the strands of timber out in the hills there and bring it down to the waterfront to be shipped domestically as well as internationally. Now, Dickman Mill traces its start to 1889 when Abraham Young began the first mill on that location. He had a shingle mill and it didn't last very long. It only lasted a couple of years before the depression of the 1890s really did a number on a lot of the industries here. So we went through a couple other short-lived owners, um, primarily as a shingle mill. And then uh, it became owned by C.D. Danabar. 
the early 1900s, and he was the one who actually made it a success, up to a point. But the Nickman Mill, we call the longest operational mill because there was a functional sawmill on that location for 88 years. So it was only Nickman Mill from 1922 through 1977, but because it had been in operation on that same site since 1889, we count that as that 88 year stretch. When it closed, Dickman Mill was also the last remaining overwater mill. In addition to being the longest running operational, um, it was the last overwater mill when it closed. Your fun fact of the day, well, hopefully you'll have more than one fun fact after this talk, but one of those fun facts is that um, the Defiance Mill, which was all the way down close to the Asarco smelter, actually had buildings that were up longer than Dickman, but they weren't operational. So Dickman Mill still gets that um, claim to fame that it was the last operational sawmill along Rustin Way. So here's your, some photographs of the mill. You can see there the cranes that were in operation as well as the stacks of lumber. At the height of its operation, Dickman Mill was the fourth largest mill on Rustin Way. St. Paul and Tacoma Lumber Company was the biggest, and there were a couple others in between there. Um, I believe um, it might have been Hanson Ackerson or Defiance Mill or the other two. However, you can go find out for yourself when you go to the Tacoma Store Society's new exhibit, Opening Wednesday. So as I mentioned, uh, Danaher had the mill through the early 1900s and uh, he passed away in 1921. There was a bit of a lumber depression in the early 20s. Um, and the stories say that Mr. Danaher had some personal problems as well, so he ended up killing himself. Um, however, the mill survived. It kind of had a year in a little state as the ownership still being worked out. And then um, Ralph Dickman purchased the mill in 1922. Uh, he was a manager there, and so he, along with a business partner, gathered the funds needed to purchase the mill and invested in it. And then, as it happened, for you know, whether it was good luck or bad luck, depending on your perspective, but in 1923, there was an earthquake in Japan creating this demand for lumber, as, and much in the same way that the San Francisco earthquake um, caused a huge spike in the lumber industry up here, the Japanese earthquake in 1923 caused a similar ripple effect. So what had been a depression vanished and there was suddenly a high demand for this kind of structural lumber that Nickman Mill created. So Ralph Nickman was succeeded through this kind of the quirk of the, the times, but I think there's also credit to be given just for his management style in that he did run a one shift 40 hour work week um, 7.30, 7.45 to 4.30, and that was not the usual. There were often times three shifts um, in these mills, and they ran for more than that 40-hour work week. Ralph also committed to upgrading the mill. So you'll see in that picture the cranes, and when he purchased the mill in the early 1920s, he immediately set to work to upgrading the equipment. So he brought in new cranes, uh, he upgraded from steam, to electric for a lot of the machinery. And here are some of the, the saw blades that were on the Nickman Mill head saw, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, but that was one of his upgrades. It was 1923 when that head saw was created in Everett, Washington by Sumner Ironworks. Um, so it came down and it represented, again, the, the forefront of technology at the time, or had capacity to mill the very large timbers up to eight feet in diameter, um, but also can create just the dimensional lumber that was in demand. In addition to being able to see the advantage of investing in the, the new equipment, Ralph Dickman was also able to see the advantages of working with a unionized workforce. So in this picture here, there's Ralph um, as the, the sole white person in that image. You might be able to see his little face there. But uh, he is behind the motorcycle, like second to the far left. Um, so this, these are a, work at, a group of Japanese employees at the mill. And although there were instances where Japanese immigrants or Japanese Americans 
were hired as strike breakers, as scabs to overcome strikes when there was, you know, a union push for better wages. In the 1940s, the Japanese were part of the local unions. I haven't dug into the labor history as deeply as I might have, so there's a few gaps in my knowledge there, but I will acknowledge that in the 1934, 1935, those were big years for organized labor in Tacoma. Um, and I'm sure there's more historians here in the audience that may know the stories in more detail. Um, Dickman Mill was affected by those, as was a lot of the waterfront industry. However, um, they were a union shop. And I found a document related to the Japanese Citizens League in 1942, writing to the state saying, are you know, Japanese American Japanese immigrants are actively contributing to local economies. And here is exactly how. So they had lists of um, you know, different industries and then how many Japanese were employed. So they had a page for the logging industry and the timber industry. Um, and they talked about the different mills in Tacoma. And they called out Nickman Mill of 110 employees, eight of those were Japanese. And um, I think St. Paul and Tacoma had the, the, the highest count of Japanese as well as highest percentage. They had, of course, far more employees overall. Um, so by the 1940s, uh, Japanese immigrants and uh, Japanese Americans were, in fact, unionized in our lumber mills. So after the, the turmoil of the 30s and 40s, um, Ralph Dickman Sr. retired. He retired pretty early. And his son, Ralph Dickman II, also known as Bud, uh, took over operation of the mill, keeping it in the family. The industry here was kind of an interesting mix of collaboration and competition. So all of the lumber mills you know, along the waterfront that were producing the same type of lumber were in fact competing for markets and for consumers. However, they also were able to collaborate and work together. For example, um, several mills owned a steamer in, together, they co-owned it. And the steamer Lake Francis was owned by the uh, St. Paul Tacoma Lumber Company, Defiance Mill, and Hickman Mill. Again, they also had formed a coalition um, of lumber, you know, managers and owners to advocate for the sale of sawdust as a fuel. So there was this push to sell the sawdust, the byproduct of the mill, um, as a product in and of itself. And indeed, many homes in Tacoma burned sawdust in the early part of the 1900s in order to, you know, have a cheap economical um, fuel to heat their homes. As you see here, there was the, the mill on the waterfront, but then there was also the process of getting your timber to your mill. And on the left here is um, a parade that took place in Shelton. You'll see the Shelton Hotel sign there. And then the trucks have the, the logs on them with the sign saying Dickman Lumber Company on the side. And this was part of like, like an industry parade. So this is not your typical, you know, how do you get the timber from the forest to the mill and does not generally go through the middle of town with a giant sign on it. You know, it's crowds of the people cheering on either side. However, um, it's a great reminder that the trees had to come from somewhere. For Dickman Mill, most of the, their timber was purchased at auction, but for a brief moment, they had a, their own timber stand up near Lake Cushman. And in that instance, it was a matter of they had a lumber camp that, you know, cut down the trees, put them in the, the river and then shift them down to a mill to a pond and then actually went cutting the trees, putting on trucks, trucking them to the water and then um, floating them down to the mill whereupon they were processed and then shipped out either by train um, or by ship for export. Nickman Mill uh, primarily exported overseas just because the market was better at the time, um, but they did some domestic as well. In the early 1900s, there was some production of wood that went to local boat builders. However, their main product was the structural timber. And they were, in fact, known for being able to do outsize pieces of lumber, um, which included, you know, boards up to 65 feet 
loam, uh, and they specialized in green clear lumber, which is a very particular grade, um, and primarily for, for builder, building for structures. Um, from what I've been able to uncover, like Douglas fir and cedar were the most commonly milled along the waterfront here, but um, I believe they did some other woods as well. Um, primarily soft woods, right? That's what you want for your structures. So the rest of the waterfront during this whole period was changing. As we mentioned, the Nickman Mill was in operation from the 1880s, 1889, all the way through 1977 in one form or another. And then during that time, the mills that had just lined the waterfront in the early part of the century faded one by one. There were many fires, um, just the nature of working with wood and that create glass and sawdust when you're working with machinery, sparks catch fire. And so many of the, the mills that were built alongside the Dickman Mill um, were burned, some were rebuilt, some were not. And of course, the various rise and fall of the industry itself took a toll. And there was you know, an increasing conversation around what should be on this waterfront. So you'll see below that main picture, there's the top of the ocean restaurant, which was built in 1949. Uh, you'll see there's also, you know, increasing parking next to the wigwam burner there, the hog fuel burner um, down below in the right part of the screen here. And so increasingly, there was a desire to make the waterfront accessible as a recreation destination. And so even in the 1950s and 60s, there was starting to be this discussion about, from the city's perspective, should we restrict development along the waterfront and what maybe you know, the better use of this, given the fact that the industry is fading and there's all these kind of abandoned pilings and buildings no falling into disrepair. There's also um, some winter storms that came into the destruction along waterfront um, from some of these derelict structures. So it was kind of an ongoing conversation that had a number of different factors influencing it. So Ralph Skip Dickman, Ralph Dickman III, was known as Skip. Uh, he took some um, managerial roles from his father in the 1970s, but even as early as 1974, the Dickmans knew that they were going to be closing the mill. Um, again, it was a competition from people like Weyerhaeuser, who owned their own timber stands and could afford to, you know, mill their own lumber. And then this competition for um, purchasing timber at auction in order to mill was getting too costly. Additionally, there were um, there were some labor issues in the 70s and the mill couldn't afford to pay union wages. So it was a combination of this competition for the product as well as the labor costs were getting too high. So the mill closed. Um, in 1976, uh, a young Ron Karabayich had received permission from, from Bud Dickman um, to do some filming of the mill in its last days of operation. So a big thanks to Ron for capturing that footage and we were able to use it in a brief little video talking about the history of the mill narrated by Skip Dickman as he um, shared some of his memories and recollections of the mill um, with Melissa McGinnis um, a couple of years ago when they did a StoryCorps interview. So if you see that video, um, it's very short, it's like not even five minutes, but it's a nice kind of just a, a fun way to think about the mill's history from someone who was there. Um, so in 76, the mill was closing down. In 77, it was finally fully closed. Um, all of the wood had been sold off. So the buildings were still there and the equipment was still there. They're looking for a buyer for the land. And so um, they finally sold it at auction in 1978. So the mill and the grounds were sold in 78. Um, and then in a peculiar twist of fate, the mill that had survived so many years, untouched by fire, when many of its compatriots had succumbed to the blaze of their, you know, the hazard of their industry, Dickman Mill finally burned in 1979 after it had closed. The auction took place in 1978 in the fall. They were still um, actually removing the machinery that had been purchased. And um, from the new owners in the, over that winter. And then in January, um, 
the official fire department report says that a spark from one of the acetylene torches uh, got, you know, fell underneath the floorboards, smoldered there overnight, and then caught fire on a Saturday, and the mill was a total loss. However, the main office survived, and some of the records survived as well. So we were able to use those in the reference for doing the, the research on this project. The Tacoma Historical Society has some of those records. And then I think there's a couple other repositories that have some as well. So we are almost to the park part of the story. Um, but first, you have to get through the sad story of the destruction of the mill. As you can see, the, the devastation, you know, flattened the landscape, um, but it didn't destroy it. It did not remove all of the piers or the, the ruined uh, concrete outlines in the buildings. And so you can still see that today. And that informed the design of the park, actually. I will note that the mill fire is something of a you know, a big moment in time for old town residents, because it did, in fact, the sparks from the fire did blow up the hillside, and several people lost their roofs to this fire. So it was certainly a night that will live on in the memories of those who were there. And the other part that many may remember who were in Old Town or in Tacoma at the time was how long that rubble stayed around. So the mill burns in January 79, the rubble sits there for another two years as all of the insurance companies have to work through the claims. Since it was a rather suspicious fire, the new owners had to have an investigation performed before their insurance company would pay out. Additionally, um, I mentioned that some of the equipment had been purchased by... And so when the equipment burned by these other owners, you had to factor in their claims, um, and some of these were out of state. So you had like Idaho, um, Idaho interest had purchased pieces of the equipment, as did somebody in California. So there was a lot of paperwork, thing one. But thing two was that you also had an ongoing conversation about the ideal use of the space. So the new owners were developers who wanted to transform the space into condos, was kind of their first idea. They had thought about doing a dry dock for a little while, or doing some sort of a boat building marine operation um, or like an actual marina. So they had a lot of ideas, but they had to get through city council first. And this was again in that period when restrictions on the waterfront and what you could actually build there were under discussion. They wanted to preserve a lot of the waterfront for public access. So they pre prevented residential uses, right? But then the condos, as you might imagine, caught a lot of people um, off guard or just caused a lot of concerns for a lot of the residents who did not want to have their water taken up with, you know, a million story tall condos and hotels and totally blocking the view and changing the, the character of the landscape. So there was a little bit of, you know, the, the planning commission deciding what they could actually do on the site. And then of course there was the um, financial issues for the new owners having to pay to get the permits to clear all the stuff off the site and since it had been an industrial site, there was also some hazardous materials to consider as well. So combination of factors made it such that the mill site was not cleaned up until years afterward. Um, here is a picture of the interior of the mill. So you can see this is the head saw, um, which we have now restored on site. And there's a picture that shows you what it looked like before the fire. And then the one that showed you what it looked like after the fire. And so the logs would be put onto those carriages on the arms there, and um, then go straight back past the little square building. That's where the saw was. And so you can see that there's the blade going, coming down the front of that little square box. And the log would just go right by them and get sawn off piece by piece. And of all of the equipment that had been in the ruined saw mill, there it was, the head saw, which Ralph Dickman had purchased from Sumner Iron, from Sumner Iron Works in Everett um, back in 1923. So this was kind of the, the centerpiece of the mill and allowed them to do their dimensional number. 
and yet it survived this massive fire. However, it took kind of the, the work of one man to see that this was not just a ruined piece of equipment, but was in fact a moment to preserve a relic of this bygone era of industry on Rustin Way. So Ad Cummings led the charge to preserve this piece of history. Um, and he had a boat building uh, operation just a few doors down on Rustin Way, the Cummings Boat Building Company, um, where Cummings Park is today. And so he got a group of folks together, managed to get his crane down to this site and extracted the head saw, top wheel, bottom wheel, carriage, pulley, pulled it all out and set about making it into a local landmark. Um, along with Caroline Galachi and Ron Carabayat, he did the research on the head saw and the mill and uh, wrote up the nomination form. So the head saw was in fact listed to the state register of historic places and the Tacoma Historic Register as well. He always had the goal of um, preserving it and presenting it in a display on Rustin Way in order to tell the story of the mills and the contribution to the Tacoma lumber industry that Nickman Mill provided. Um, so after the fire, it was again pulled out of the, the wreckage. I'm not sure how he swung that um, entirely, but the city of Tacoma ended up purchasing it from the owners who had originally purchased it after the auction. So it was owned by the city of Tacoma after Ad Sweet talked them into it. Um, and they pulled it aside, they labeled it for the short term in the 70, 1979, early 80s. Um, they were able to work it out with the park. So they had it on display at Marine Park, which is now Judge Jack Tanner Park, just a little ways down the waterfront. Um, and had that little sign talking about what it was and why it was there. As you can see, however, it was a less than ideal display location. They really wanted to be able to tell the story of how the, the, uh, the logs came through the saw and to have the top and bottom wheel there. You can see the, the bottom wheel is in fact in it, so it's kind of hard to see. Um, and then you have the carriage there all lined up so you can at least see how that part worked. So less than ideal, um, but it was it was there through the 80s. However, it wasn't going to be a long-term solution, right? You can see that that's kind of a, an ad hoc um, short-term solution. To add credit, he was able to you know salvage it in the first place. He also was able to rig up a motor. So for a time, the wheel actually spun. Um, but I don't believe that functionality lasted very long just without anyone caring for it. So. Unfortunately, it kind of fell into even further disrepair over the years. It was moved to the Point Defiance maintenance yard and kind of over by the shops there in the late 1990s when park improvements began to happen. And we knew that we wanted to make this into a display and to be able to restore Dickman Mill Park as a site to bring people to, um, but we weren't quite there yet. For those of the mechanical inclination, um, you may have already read about the head saw itself, but it was originally powered by a Westinghouse 350 horsepower, 440 volt engine, and 300 RPM type MR synchronous drive motor. In its entirety, it stood 34 feet tall and weighs 15 tons. The carriage there that moved the log along um, is 12 foot tall and 45 feet long. You go from one end to the other. Um, part of what makes this uh, so valuable as an artifact is that it is the only saw in Washington state that of this type, of this era, 1920s, that has both um, the intact wheel structure as well as the carriage and the pulley. So it was originally listed on the, on the state register due to its unaltered nature and that unlike many other saws of its time and place, um, it was not modified for smaller dimensional lumber, but was retained in the same full size. So it could cut logs up to eight feet, sorry, up to 10 feet in diameter. That was kind of the max, um, but 36 inches, three feet was a lot more of the average of what it actually processed, but it was unmodified. So it could have actually handled a, a 10 foot diameter log had the occasion arisen. Today, there is a mill in Oregon that uses a Law, uh, a hand saw very similar to this one that can in fact mill up to 11 
foot diameter logs. And the, the, the workers there say that they've, they've seen it done. You know, it's not very common, but the one time they did, in fact, have a chance to put it to the test. So there you go. Um, the blade itself was 15 inches. We saw earlier in the show, in the slide show, the picture of the saw, the saw blades using the shop. And they were 15 inches in diameter um, or 15 inches wide and were resharpened periodically throughout the day. So they'd whip the head, the saw, band saw off the wheel, sharpen it, put it back on. Um, and they did that multiple times throughout the day. And um, when it got down to a 12 foot, 12 inch width, so from 15 inches down to 12 inches, that was when it was time to get just a new saw blade entirely lest it get too thin and break. As I mentioned, oh, here's more information about the head saw if you'd like to see what it looked like. Um, so there's a picture of when it was removed from, I think that might have been um, the 1980s when it was removed from Marine Park. Um, and you can also see then there's that little uh, graphic showing you how it actually worked. That is featured on one of the interpretive signs that we have on our um, new park space. So we'll talk about some of those. Um, and can you talk a little bit more about how we have shown the head saw today? Here's some of the, the article headlines talking about the struggle to get this site cleared. Um, so again, from 79 to 81, like summer 81, it was a fuss about getting this ugly eyesore cleaned up. Um, they were, again, insurance investigators who wanted to do their own research and they, they were not necessarily satisfied with the fire department's uh, report, um, but ultimately all the insurance claims were paid and um, the owners never got around to doing their development. They, they just ran out of money and possibly enthusiasm by the end of it. Instead, the city of Tacoma and Metro Parks both knew they would like to have part of the parcels. Um, there was a question about funding, of course. So City of Tacoma did buy a small parcel of the mill property, but it was farther down. And then the bulk of the property was in fact purchased by uh, Metro Parks with the help of a state grant. So today the park proper is Metro Parks facility. In the beginning of the 1990s, they cleared away the remaining rubble that had not been cleared by the owners um, of the original disaster site. Um, but it was cleared, it was hazardous uh, materials had been appropriately handled, and there was the desire to restore the natural shoreline habitat. And that is in fact what they did. So in the first phase in the kind of late 90s, early 2000s, um, you had the you know cleanup of the abandoned site. You had habitat restoration um, and addition of a restroom and um, an estuary there. So there is a like a little tidal estuary where the water could come in uh, and feed the little wetland area there and then go back out. Um, the phase two of the original kind of reclaiming of the space took place um, in 2002, 2003, 2004. And you had more cleanup work for the habitat area as well as the addition of the um, plaza with tables and a, more of the paved walkway. At this time, there's also the addition of copper artwork. And so this was just kind of a way to tell the story of the site um, with a little bit of artistic flair. You, if you've been down there recently, you will know that only one of these two copper um, plates on the restroom remains. One of them was in fact stolen, but the other one is still there. And I don't know how many people actually notice the fence posts, but there are actual little lines of poetry that were um, added. And I think they originally they had like little copper caps, but those might have been um, lost over the years. But the little rock around piece is still there. So next time you're out there, take a walk around the wetland area and see what they all say. I should note that um, the, the piece of copper from the restroom wall was a copy of a front page newspaper article about the fire at the mill. And then the other one that's still there is actually a map of the historic Hickman Mill 
and the layout of the mill when it was operational. So how did we get to the reinst reinstallment of the head saw today? This came down to Candia Health Solutions, which is um, underneath Regents Blue Shield, who in 2017 were looking for an opportunity to celebrate their centennial. So they trace their origins to 1917 in the lumber camps of this area of Tacoma um, and providing health insurance to the lumbermen there. So when uh, Metro Parks said, you know, we have this historic head saw that we've been looking for a way to display, um, they said, that sounds like a great project, we'd love to help. So through a very generous contribution of a $7.9 million donation, um, we were able to uh, improve the park site itself and restore the head saw to the location. So that meant uh, cleaning the artifact itself, providing a new coating for it, and then reinstalling it in as close of the location as we can manage to the original location of the head saw when the, the mill was fully operational. The design of this space was and the legacy of the workers who were able to you know, get their livelihood through mills like this one. So you'll notice um, the detail of this little walkway out past the saw part. This is kind of intended to reflect the, the mill pond where all the logs were floating before they were processed through the mill. You see all the kind of crossways flanking there. And then the shape of that little catwalk end is also intentional in that it evokes the curve of the blades of the saw. So if you can imagine a bandsaw having all those little teeth, and that would kind of mimic the shape of those teeth. Um, on the deck itself, so when you walk over to visit the head saw, you'll see these little stacks of lumber, which of course are benches, but um, calling back to the site you would have seen at the mill back in the day. Um, and then the pulley also with the rails showing you where the carriage would have gone back and forth past the saw blade. That picture there with the construction guys um, is Skip Dickman and his wife. And they um, are still in the area. Skip is continuing the lumber tradition with his own uh, business with the um, Dickman Hines Lumber Wholesale on the Federal Way. And his son Blair is actually still in the family business as well. And they're like fourth generation lumbermen at this point. Um, I almost forgot to mention the bricks here. So these are original bricks that were reclaimed from the shoreline as part of this project. And they were most likely from um, the old hog fuel burner, which was called the wigwam burner um, because of its shape. But the bricks were scattered along the waterfront and they were primarily from um, when the burner was actually upgraded in like the 1950s after a winter storm knocked it out. That was when they kind of did away with it um, shortly after. And so the bricks have been there for years and years. Um, and actually part of the mitigation measures since we're working on um, habitat, wetland habitat, was to clear off the bricks from the beach. And we were able to reuse them, which is pretty cool. A lot of them have uh, markers on them, like maker's marks. So our archaeologist team was able to trace them back to um, the, the brick makers in England. So some of those brick makers have been around since the 1860s. So it's entirely possible some of these bricks have been circulating since, you know, 150 years ago. So kind of a cool part of the story there. So next time you're out, make sure you look down next to the saw base and see what you can see with the bricks there. Um, you'll also notice the very large, very beautiful ghost log art piece on site there. And this was something that came out in the Metro Parks uh, commitment to 1% for the art, which is a program that we've been doing since 2014 where 1% of the MAC of the construction cost of capital projects go into a general district art fund. And we can use the art fund for projects um, throughout the district. If it's a project, capital project that's $5 million or more, then and there is going to be art integrated into the capital project. If it's smaller than that, um, it'll just kind of be an option that if capital project seems like a good fit, we have a public art committee in Metro Parks that evaluates the opportunities for where we should spend the um, public art dollars. So in this piece, we knew there was gonna be art and we brought in the artists early on in the design process. And the design team knew we wanted to have some sort of a log representing what would have been going through the saw. 
And then there's this great moment um, where we thought, you know what, that can be an art blog. So Mary Koss, the artist who was um, commissioned, saw this opportunity, saw what could be, and came up with this beautiful design to reflect the, the transparency, um, you know, kind of the ghost log and the time long past, and that showed the kind of the progress or just evolution or development from a more industrial side through this natural form with the rings of the tree, all the way to an end that has uh, cedar boughs and uh, coiled metal twine representing the Puyallup basket tradition. So she worked closely with um, Puyallup tribal members such as Connie McLeod, consulting them to what that weave might look like. Um, and she decided to do the laser cut um, bark pattern after the cedar tree in recognition of its significance to the Puyallup people. So there is the, the log in lit up at nighttime. Um, and the other picture shows you the ends with the, the cedar boughs, the cedar leaves. And if you go on site, you'll also be able to see that there are words in kind of a, a cursive script in that end of the art piece that reflect what it is. So um, Mary talked to the you know, tribal language program and um, put some words in the shoot seed there. Words like, you know, shoot seed for cedar or bow or um, kind of tree limb. So we will have a plaque out there telling you what those are so you can try to, to spy them in the midst of the basket weave. We don't have the plaque out there yet. Um, so just you know it's coming and it'll be a great addition to the site in addition to what is already out there. We are um, also doing an interpretive element. So not only do we have the arts interpreting the story in the space, but we also have some signs telling you how the mill worked and where you were on site. Um, there were already interpretive signs out at the park, so those are still there, and some of those talk about the wetland improvement. So um, by all means, please take a look at those if you want more information about the plantings that were done. There is also an, an audio art component here I'm working on. She is going to be interviewing to all elders and having some of the cedar blessing uh, songs recorded. She has permission for them, from them to do that. And then um, she'll also be interviewing mill workers and some historians, including um, Brandon Reyna with the Field Tribal Historic Preservation Department, um, about the kind of significance of the waterfront and just the lumber industry as well. Um, although the lumber industry did represent the end of a way of life for the Puyallup people, it was also part of their story in that um, Puyallup were able to find jobs in the lumber mills along Rustin Way and in Tacoma, as well as providing timber that was then sold to the mills for processing. Connie McLeod was at the dedication event for the, the mill um, and spoke a few words at the beginning and um, mentioned that you know, her grandfather would tell them about being proud of being able to provide for his family by um, you know, participating in this industry. More to come, um, but we're pretty proud of what we've managed to accomplish thus far. Um, and I'm happy to take questions. If you think of a question later, you can also email me. Um, I don't have my email on the screen right now, but I can put it in the chat here. So, uh, Kim, do you have questions? Yeah, we have one question so far, and then I'll let you know if others come up. Um, but the, the first question we have, uh, with the new renovation of the park, I thought that removal of creosote contaminated wood would be part of that. Uh, it didn't seem to be so. Uh, was creosote used in the construction of the mill? Good question. Um, yes, those are creosote coated pilings out there. Um, it was not part of the project for a couple of reasons. Primarily, um, it wasn't in the area we were working with. So we were uh, building over the old concrete pile, or concrete um, remains in the, the buildings, right? And over more of the, the land part. We intentionally were trying to avoid overwater structures just um, because there are more unknowns, there are more costs, there are more permits, right, to do overwater work. So we kind of avoided that part of it. Um, the other piece of the puzzle is that there's also a lot of Department of Natural Resource owned land just off the shore there. So that some of that is state owned uh, water. And they actually do have a plan to rem remove those pilings. 
So they are currently in a study phase, looking at what it would take to remove them, looking at the impacts to the, you know, to the, um, the floor of the ocean or the floor of the sound there. So they wouldn't be causing more disruption than, you know, was needed. Um, so they are in a study phase right now, and I don't have information about when they might start removing those, but there is a plan to proceed with that. So. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions that anyone wants to put into the chat? And I see Claire generously provided her email address if you think of others later. Um, I will add that um, thank you to the Tacoma Storm Society for helping us do the audio component of the art piece. Uh, Tacoma Storm Society is working with a grant from the Fialt Tribe to do some of those recordings and oral history interviews that will then become part of this art piece that Mary's working on. So thanks to the Tacoma Storm Society for a great partnership. Um, and also some of the photographs that were used in this presentation were from Film Storm Society. They have, as I mentioned, a couple folders and some hidden. Um, they have the entire, um, actually like assessor's value of the, the mill equipment before it went to auction. So if you wanna know what was on site in 1976 and all the equipment, they have that. Great. And that's a um, wonderful segue back to my first announcement at the start, which is that we do have our new exhibit about Tacoma's lumber history opening this coming Wednesday. So do stop in to the museum and see that. Uh, thank you so much, Claire. I really appreciate your time and just your enthusiasm for the subject and sharing all that history. I know I certainly learned a few things, so I'm, cert I'm certain that others did as well. Um, but thank you everyone for being here and we will share this presentation on YouTube and see you next month, whether in person or online. Thank you. Thanks everyone.